Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming to the Real World Summit. Um, we're gonna hop right in, time is tight. Um, each of the panelists will introduce themselves and then we'll launch into some questions and then we'll open it up for all of you. All right, I'll start with you, Peggy. Uh, thanks. Uh, Peggy Kiriakadu, uh, currently the president at NABIT 700 M uh, Unifor. We house uh, 14 of the departments, uh, the crew members, the largest component of labor on any given set. Hi, my name is Prem Gill and I'm the CEO of Creative BC. For those of you here in Ontario, if you're not familiar with us, we have a very similar mandate to Ontario Creates where we administer the provincial tax incentives, we're the film commission, and we also have grant programs. Hi everyone, I'm Marie Kelly. I'm the very proud National Executive Director for ACTRA, a union that represents performers, 28,000 of them from coast to coast to coast. Victoria Shen, Executive Director to the Writers Guild of Canada. Uh, we represent the 2,600 Canadian screenwriters across the country. And then additionally, I am a former board member to Real World. So, so great to see you today. It's wonderful. Um, it's great to have all of you here. Uh, it's been a really crazy year in our industry, um, both domestically and for our friends south of the border. I think one of the things I want to start with is to ask each of you, you know, given you know what's happening with the strikes down south and the fact that, that even though the, the Writers Guild strike ended, you know, last month and or I guess two months now given that we're now in November and SAG AFTRA hopefully will be ending this week fingers crossed um, many of us believe the strikes have had a huge impact on our industry here in Canada and I'm wondering if each of you can speak to how the US strike may or may have not impacted your various constituents Victoria, you can go first. Sure. Uh, yeah, so Writers Yield of Canada, uh, WGA is our closest colleagues. Um, and so they called the strike midnight of May 2nd. Um, by 1 a.m., my phone was blowing up. And in the days that follow, that was probably the most press that we had ever gotten. Um, and I think in those early days, what the media really wanted to know was what would be the impact on the Canadian industry. And they were really pushing us because they really thought that this was going to be some kind of windfall for uh, Canadian screenwriters and for the Canadian film and television industry, that we were just suddenly going to get all this work and we were going to benefit from their strike. And what they don't understand particularly is that all writers' guilds around the world were part of the international affiliation of writers' guilds, right? So we respect each other's jurisdiction, so we don't cross that picket line. Right, and so uh, on June 14, like we had this international day of solidarity, writers, screenwriters from around the world, we rallied, at, um, uh, you know, uh, in our respective jurisdictions in support of the WGA. Um, I guess what I would also sort of add to that too is that uh, in our own membership, we have a lot of dual members. So people who are both members of our guild as well as the WGA. So we had a lot of questions about what they could do, what they couldn't do. And I would say that um, most of our members were very, very conscientious, right? Like they didn't want to cross that picket line. They wanted to sort of do the right thing. Um, and then I would also say that um, essentially all of our screenwriters work on Canadian domestic productions. And so, so those shows uh, stayed uh, un uninterrupted, and that was also the case when SAG-AFTRA later on uh, went on strike. Our writers working on those domestic shows continue to work, and that Canadian shows have been really the lifeline, I think, throughout the strike. Great, and from ACTRA's uh, perspective, it wasn't the strike that started the slowdown for us on our sets here in Canada. It was actually the threat of the strikes. What the unions did well in the US, in my opinion, is they all worked together and they all sent the message to the industry together that they were going to be working together. So 
once the writers went out on strike, we were already seeing the impacts on our sets. And then, of course, when sag After went out, it was a huge impact here in Canada. We are down, if you look from January to September of last year and you compare it to this year, we're down about 55% in earnings for our members. Uh, so it's been a huge impact that talks a bit about the fact that much of our industry is service-oriented. Uh, and we're going to be talking more about our Canadian industry, but that should be a warning sign, and we've said this at Parliament, it should be a warning sign to our governments about the importance of propping up uh, our industry and keeping it supported here in Canada. And the last thing I would say just as an opening on this one is that as well, we are 555 days into a lockout of performers here in Canada when it comes to our commercial sector. So having that already impacting the income of performers who need to be able to f make a living in this industry in order to service the industry, they now have the lockout piled on top of them with the sag after strike and the fact that many of our sets have shut down for that. So uh, I think that the impact of the strike for performers here in Canada has been really significant. Yeah, I can speak to it from a, a slightly different perspective. We're not a membership organization, and we're, you know, we're not a union, we're not the employers, uh, but as the Film Commission and as the organization that really works very closely, everybody knows that BC and the Metro Vancouver region in particular um, is a large hub for the service industry in Canada, as is you know the Toronto region. Uh, we're really proud of the industry and what it's built out there um, and across the country, and and it's been it's challenging. It's it's been you know really rough for a lot of people like we are normally this time of year in BC we'd have anywhere from 40 to 50 productions at a different stage of production and I think right now we're at about 17 um, you know we have it's been a long time since we've had Canadian productions in BC uh, but we do actually have three scripted series and maybe a couple of features some movies of the week so that's that it's interesting though that business was already coming to BC it's not necessarily um, an opportunity that was created because of the strikes so we really you know it, it, it's challenging and you know we look to the labor organizations and everybody that we work closely with on how do we ensure that the conditions in BC remain attractive for when that business does come back that we are ready to go that um, we remain we have the the things in place that will continue to attract that service production. You know, we're not shy about the fact that it's an important part of our economy in BC. It's an important part of the infrastructure. Our provincial government supported Creative BC with more funding this year prior to all of this to support more domestic production. And we really hope that the other sides of C11 and all these things encourage more of that production outside of major regions like Ontario as well. So um, yeah, it's everybody here knows people who work in, you know, in different parts of the industry and it's, it's, it's tough. It's really not great right now. And we're just hoping for a positive income, a positive outcome um, soon for everybody so that people can get back to work. Similarly to all my colleagues that have spoken already with Nabit 700M, we're here in Toronto, in Ontario. We're not a national, we're, we're just here in uh, Toronto, Ontario. So our membership has relied greatly on the domestic work. Um, Nabit does 54% domestic work on a regular basis. And what the strikes have done is really shown um, us as well as everyone who has spoken how important domestic work is not to take the value of the service work away because clearly we've evolved as an industry the service work that comes up to Canada is as important as the domestic work but we at NABET are trying to stay in touch with everyone our government bodies and as Victoria mentioned and Marie we we all talk to one another we know what was happening in the states we were prepared and with us as well half of our membership has worked a greater part of the year and comparatively to last year they are earning half the wages they would have last year so it has definitely impacted us and we're hoping that we can drive the message home that the domestic market is as important because if we were able to drive that up even slightly and keep the service work coming as it has been. Just imagine this year would have been a little bit easier on the Canadian uh, technicians, the film industry, the Canadian creators that are here that are suffering along with all the technicians in the United States. Thank you guys for that.
Um, but it's interesting, though, because I feel like even prior to the strikes and even prior to the threat of the strikes, our industry was really, seems to be really going through this, like, the cycle of uncertainty. And, like, I'm curious to know from each of you, like, what, what do you think the cause of that has been? Like, why is there that uncertainty in the air? Oh, Eric's looking, looking at me. Okay. Uh, no, it's all good. No. Um, I, I do think it's the shift to streaming, right? Like, so everybody sort of cut the core. Nobody, you know, really subscribes to cable anymore. It's all the subscriptions, the streamers. And so, particularly in the U.S., all the major U.S. studios have also, I think, in recent years, developed their own streaming service. And that was a major capital investment. They also had to buy a lot of content to populate those streaming services. And then I think there was a great um, deadline article a few months ago that basically said none of those streaming services are making money except for Netflix. And so when they built up that those streaming services, they bought a lot of content, they made a lot of content, and they're not seeing the return on that. So there is a contraction now because they're not investing in the same thing. So I think for those big US studios, they're just not sure what the new business model is going to be. Because really, what was driving a lot of their revenue was actually advertising, right? So you make great shows that drive audiences to your channel, and then you sell advertising. And so now there's no ads, but that's also shifting in the streamers. So I think, like when we talk about labor agreements, those agreements are based on a certain understanding of how the business works. And if the business is changing, then I think studios, streamers, employers are very reluctant to agree to certain things because they don't know how they're making their money, so they don't want to give you any of the money either. So I think those, that's, there's some major shifts happening. The other thing that I've seen too, and you might have noticed it when you're watching shows, there's a lot, of, there's a lot short, fewer episodes, right? So a lot of the network shows were like 22 episodes. Now you're seeing like six to 10. And so from a producing perspective, right? Like there's just a lot fewer hours of television, right? And it's harder to get more shows greenlit as opposed to more episodes of the same show, right? So I think we're definitely seeing that as screenwriters, that when writers are working on a show, that there's just um, smaller rooms, shorter contracts, because there's just a lot fewer episodes. So I, I would agree with uh, almost everything that Victoria said. I might be slightly less sympathetic to the cry of poverty from the streamers. Uh, I, I do agree. I think the strikes are a product of the change and the shift in model and the technology and the AI and the fact that streamers are not brick-and-mortar broadcasters, so they have been partaking in our marketplace for a very long time without putting anything back in. Bill C-10, Bill C-11, the policy uh, document that we're all vying for with our federal government. So there's been a huge shift. Uh, I agree with Victoria as well. Uh, you know, you see a reduction in the episodes. That impacts performers on our back end. There has been a shift in the model, and the model is what we all embedded into our collective agreements to make sure, in our case, performers get their fair share of the revenue that comes out of the productions. That got shifted. Performers lost out on that front, as did others, but performers lost out on that front, and now we need to see some significant change. Not surprising, SAG-AFTRA is out on strike. That's one of their issues is the shift in model. The second thing that Victoria didn't mention, but I'm sure is uh, in her mind, is inflation. We're not alone. Workers the world over are saying enough is enough is enough. Inflation is high. We're not keeping up whether you're in a, a, a union and a collective agreement or whether you're non-union. We're not keeping up. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Time's up. We're all in this together. You see it everywhere across Canada. You see it around the globe. You see it in our industry. Not a big surprise. That's the other issue. In our world of performers, we also see our businesses being stolen from us. AI. AI is a great tool. We love it. It helps us a lot, not only in what we do in our homes, but what we do in our industry. But it needs fences. You cannot steal the image of a performer and expect that that's going to be okay. You can't put them in a deep fake, uh, a deep fake and say, that's okay. We don't care if we ruin your business. This is your business, your nil, your name, your likeness. 
That is all a performer's income. That's under attack. Our government needs to do something about that. So we see a change in the business model. We see inflation. We see technology taking away work. And we see a shift. Change is a great opportunity for everyone to have a conversation about what happens uh, next, but it's also an opportunity to shift the power base. And that's what you're hearing unions saying. We're not gonna let you shift the power base to be one-sided in this conversation. That's why you're seeing the strikes in the US in our industry. That's why you're seeing, you're gonna see next year a lot of unrest unless the studios and the production houses and everyone understands the shift and change has to bring everybody with them. Um, yeah, so again, from a, a slightly different perspective, you know, we are seeing a global retraction in production, right? This is what's happening. We know that the Canadian Broadcasting Act and all of the contributions are under review and there'll be new things that happen. And, you know, where I do agree is that we, we will have to continue to figure out how do we adapt to these models? How are we having those conversations now and before? Like it's not something that suddenly has appeared. These models were shifting and changing. And again, what I always think about is like, okay, how and where does British Columbia remain competitive in this when we are both supporting domestic producers, both attracting that service production? What is our infrastructure looking like? How are we continuing to support workforce development? How are we working um, always with an intersectional lens? How are we supporting reconciliation strategies? Like all of those things cannot operate in the silos. So, you know, the models, um, we can't be afraid of the change either. Obviously it's coming. So hanging on to the older models may not necessarily be helpful because I certainly don't have that much control over those models. Now, I do think that um, we've been through this before, right? We've been through uh, specialty channels coming in. We've been through, uh, I worked at a broadcaster many years ago that canceled the news completely, the six o'clock news, you know, a, a Vancouver broadcaster canceled the six o'clock news. So these are things that continue to change. And, the, and um, you know, we don't know what the other side is gonna look like 18 months from now, but that is the dialogue is important and the venues and the conversations and bringing those different perspectives and voices to the table is critical as part of that. I. I have to agree. I mean, really, a lot of what's been said already, I'm not going to repeat. Evolution, as we all know, is difficult for a lot of us. You get used to something the way that it's been, and then you want to keep it that way. We recognize now, and the strikes are happening because the model's broken, and we need to fix it. And we do create amazing work. We do it everywhere, all over the world. We do it here in Canada. We do it everywhere. And we need to fix the model because streaming is, is a new way and everybody loves it. I'm sure we all have it. We all watch it. We've all blown through a series on a weekend that's taken someone four to six months to make. So we have to be cognizant of what we do. And as Victoria said, like I, I'm a 30-year technician. I used to be able to get one series and know I had work for nine months. That doesn't happen anymore. So then we have to create a way that everyone sees successes in what we do. Because what we do is important. Might not be saving lives per se, I always say this, but, but in a way sometimes it is because through COVID, I think that's what we all did. We had what we produce as an industry that kept us all going because we couldn't go out and we couldn't do anything. We think we've proven the importance of what we do. And I think that the new model, I don't know what's coming out the other end, but no, these conversations have started from a long time ago, not just these strikes, these two unions that have stood up and taken this front. Hopefully they'll find a way that will lend because all of us will go back to the table. Several of us go, several of us are doing it now and several of us will go back to our table to negotiate our collective agreements next year. So we need to figure out this new model. We need to do it together and that's what we're working on now. Thank you, that was great guys. Um, Peggy, I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know, I feel like as a writer, the last year has felt extremely quiet. And I'm just curious from, because 
I guess in my mind, I, I keep thinking about, you know, friends of mine in, on the East Coast who probably, because there's a lot of service work out there, they probably haven't worked um, this year. And if they have, maybe they've worked on one or two shows. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, like, are you hearing that from your members? Like, what's, what's the story happening with NAPED? Um, I think generally because, as I said, 50% of our membership has been working, right, pretty solid for the bulk of this year. And they feel um, the sort of lull in our industry. Again, we're grateful for the domestic work. We feel what's happening in, on the East Coast, the West Coast. We know what's happening because we all do stay in touch. They're... They're, they're very cognizant of it, and those that are working are so grateful to be working. But again, with NABAC, because 54% is always domestic work, we're so more aware how important domestic work is. So we're very loud and proud and currently working with our government bodies and our industry partners to make certain that message is getting across. We have been here for a long time. We've established who we are here in Canada, right? And especially, you know, in, in Vancouver, in Toronto, the East Coast is blowing up. We have a great infrastructure here in Canada, right? We have an amazing industry with amazing Canadian creators across the board, writers and actors and technicians and everybody that does it. We have great tax credits. We work closely with our government bodies to make sure those stay in place. So service work comes up. We have great locations, we have great everything. So we've established that and now we have to keep establishing. If we can bolster the domestic work, even by 15%, this year wouldn't have been as hard on uh, us here in Canada. And the service work will keep coming because we have established the greatness that we can do here with our industry partners and across Canada. It's important. So I think that generally, our membership is pleased that they have the domestic work we have currently, and, and they're looking forward to sort of fixing this model and continuing to have service work come and us being able to do it, but to continue to bolster our domestic market. And Marie, how would you like to talk about that from an actor's perspective? I guess it depends on how you define quiet. <laughs> Uh, you know, as I said, you know, the commercial lockout has taken work away from performers, so that really has taken uh, uh, some work away and it's quiet. Uh, the fact that we have the service industry pretty much shut down has made that quiet. Um, I would say, though, when you're talking about quiet, it depends on your definition. From a performer's perspective, it's become a bit more isolationist. Performers really... Uh, their creativity is best at work when it's in a room full of people. And since COVID, we've been doing our auditions on tape, right? So I hear lots from performers about the impact of that technology and COVID and what it's brought to the performers world who really uh, are at their best when they're in a room full of people and being directed. But not so quiet on the legislative front, right? We are madly uh, working away, having conversations with our federal government because they're bringing in pieces of legislation that are going to be very important to every person in this room, right? They're looking at the Broadcasting Act. They finally got it through despite all of the fights of the streamers. They got it through, but they have to operationalize it with a policy document. And that is a fist fight. Make no mistake about it. I've been in Ottawa lobbying on this in order to protect Canadian content. And, you know, I'll just tell you, went in to speak with one of the MPs who has no desire to keep any CanCon protections in our country. And when at the end of the meeting, I asked her, like, what will you do if in fact you're wrong and you kick out the third leg of our industry here in Canada and you have no Canadian content protections and the whole industry falls, what will you do? And she said, well, I guess that's going to be the industry's problem to fix. So these things matter a lot. We're talking about AI, and uh, from a performer's perspective, we need your nil rights protected. AI needs to have some walls around it. And, you know, when it comes to copyright, I will never understand, and I'm not knocking musicians, but I will never understand why this country decided that musicians should have 
uh, rights in the Copyright Act that are moral rights and economic rights, and yet performers shouldn't. So, you know, we need to get those protections embedded because we're talking about, in this country, what we're going to do with producers and their IP. We also need to talk about what are the rights of performers when it comes to their contribution to the product. So, quiet on one front but very, very noisy on the other. That's great. <laughs> I'm just going to shift and maybe talk about um, something that could be a potential impact in our industry uh, if there is this, I mean, what I'm hearing is that, you know, I think last year there were 500 and... 70 some odd shows produced in the US and the thinking from you know all the analysts in the US is that you know the plan is that that's going to uh, reduce by half in the next little while and so if that happens i guess one of the things that you know i would be concerned about is that you know since i guess two, uh, 2020 what year are we in now? <laughs> um, you know, we've made some significant strides in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, both behind the camera and on screen. And I'm curious that if we come out of these strikes and we have these expected reductions, um, are there any concerns? And I mean, from either any of you can answer this, are there any concerns that you may have regarding? how that potential trend may impact efforts in the EDI space. I'll jump in. Yes. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we have made great gains that are not anywhere close to being far enough. So that tells you just how far uh, you know, we've started uh, behind. Yes, I'm always worried. Uh, I am worried uh, on a number of fronts because you know, whenever you have power, uh, that is, uh, you know, a small group of people at the top, and that small group of people are from one demographic, uh, tend to be white male, or any demographic, I worry about their ability to bring the industry forward into where we need to be. On the flip side, I'm very happy with what I see happening. I know they realize now, with all of the shows that are monetized, right, they realize that there's actually, hey, the general population wants to see more than white people in an upscale house in uh, you know, downtown LA, right? There are really good stories that are capturing people that are diverse. And so they know there's money to be made and that's the best way to draw the industry and to keep them with us on our drive for more equity. It will depend, in my humble view, it will depend on all of us. And I take a page from uh, Obama who says, Change is possible, but only if we all fight for it. It will take all of us to keep them on the straight and narrow. It will take all of us to make sure that we keep talking about this issue. It will take all of us to lobby our government to make sure they're putting their money behind the issue that's important to Canadians, that's important to us who work in the industry. So I'm hopeful, but I'm also very, very suspicious and watchful. So it's... As a former board member to Real World, it's so great to see how the festival has grown over the years. It's so great to see such a large room and all of you here. And I think that there is a critical growing, a critical mass of us who are here in the industry. And I think in recent years, we have become a lot more vocal and a lot more organized and a lot more visible. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, at the WGC, we released our um, annual diversity report, and what we see, and it, it's a report that we do every year, and what we've seen, it's, it's not dissimilar to what's happening across the industry, is that um, the, the new people who are joining the industry are increasingly more diverse. And so in everybody's sort of membership, we do see like an aging population that is more predominantly male and white, but the new generation is increasingly diverse. And so, you know, um, as there are more of us and as we all lift each other up in this industry, right? Like I, I think that, um, 
the change is here to stay. And I think it's just so important that we continue to be vocal, to remain organized, and to be visible because that, um, like, it can backslide at any time, right? And before there were strikes, there were all kinds of reasons why, you know, there were these systemic barriers even before the strikes, right? So, so that can be at any time. And so the fact that I, I feel like even a number of years ago, people thought of diversity as like this extra thing, like this thing on the side, as opposed to the main reason that was a barrier for people to get job opportunities and also to advance in their careers. So I think there is a greater awareness now, and that's at the broadcaster levels, also with the funders. Um, I think there are systemic changes that are happening. Um, also in recent years, we've seen the formation of the black screen office as well as the uh, disability screen office. Those are organizations that we partner with at the WDC. I hope they continue to be fixtures and agents of change in our industry. And I think we really need to support these new organizations that I hope are doing fantastic work. Thanks, Victoria. Um, we have time for one more question, guys. Um, so, and I really wanted to kind of try to end on a positive note. So I'll ask each of you, if you had carte blanche and you could make one change or do one thing that's going to better our industry, um, what would you implement? Carte blanche, huh? Huh. Okay, so streamers need to pay into the system immediately. I want 10 out of 10 Canadian, and then if it's only six out of 10, screenwriters need to be one of the six. We need uh, much more uh, d diverse individuals in senior executive positions and broadcasters, not just one person. <laughs> we want to see that at the funders as well. Um, yeah, and I want to see us screen lighting more interesting shows with diverse showrunners and writers who have a unique vision and voice. I came prepared. I guess we'll go down the line. Uh, it's, mine's is very similar to yours. What a shock. Uh, and as a negotiator, I just can't pick one thing. Uh, so I had said Canadian content. We have to not only preserve Canadian content, we have to improve the protections we have on the Canadian content. We got to deal with technology. We got to deal with AI. We got to put some fences around this very good tool that we have uh, to make sure it is used for good. We have to deal with the change in the business model. Uh, the streamers, we have to make sure that everybody partakes in that. And then we have to ensure that our cast, crew, writers, directors, everyone involved in our industry, we have to make sure that they can make a viable living, that they reflect our society, so that we continue to be the country that uh, the industry comes to, to do the great productions that we do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... There's many things, and I think, you know, I mean, I'm inspired by seeing so many people. It is really, um, I think, unusual still in this, being in this industry for, you know, 25 years now to be in a room that is uh, predominantly, you know, racialized and black and indigenous people, and I think that's amazing. So I want to thank Tanya for continuing to be at it. The first conversation I had with Tanya was 20 years ago about data collection. So, you know, I think that while it may seem, um, you know, not the, I'm not going to repeat things that others have already said, but us knowing where we are and what that looks like and where we're going, we need to continue to make sure that we're doing that measurement. So it's not, and it's something that I can actually do in my job, right? So I think that's um, really important and for everybody to participate in, in those things because they are making an impact. Um, I can tell you my colleagues, both at the federal organizations, at Telefilm, CMF, BSO, ISO, we're all talking constantly about this. And I think that is what is really important is that the shift that you both have noted is that this is part of the discourse. It's not, hopefully, Tanya and I have, aren't having this conversation like another 20 years from now. Kind of, I won't repeat, but agree with everything that's been said and we at NABED are working continuously and collectively. As we said, it won't happen alone and we're dedicated to obviously making sure that we 
our voices are heard with the, the, the domestic work, as well as all the, all the work we've been doing with EDI, the partnerships we've created, the pushes that we've made to diversify is, is, is still as important. So although the strikes have impacted um, work here, we are working continuously because we know traditionally we've had strikes before, they will end. It will go back to what we consider quote unquote normal and we want to keep doing what we're doing and as Victoria said, we don't want to landslide to where we've made some gains and we don't want to lose them. We're going to keep doing what we're doing to continue to bolster the industry here and continue the work we've done with everything with EDI and I also have to thank Tanya because she's done incredible work. It's been a really long time, and again, to see this room, like everyone has said, is incredible. And I think those gains are what we're gonna keep and keep working at collectively to keep making those gains visible and hopefully not have these conversations in 20 years.